It's my pleasure and honor to introduce Calvi Prize laureates of 2022 for pioneering discoveries of genes underlying a range of serious brain disorders. Our first laureate is Professor Jean-Louis Mandel. Jean-Louis was born in, and raised in Strasbourg and he completed his medical and PhD at the University of Strasbourg. Um, and then he took up a postdoctoral fellowship at the Department of Medical Genetics at uh, University of Toronto. In 1976, um, he returned to France and continued his research on human genetic disease. And he then became a director of Molecular uh, Diagnostic Laboratory at Strasbourg Regional and University Hospital Center. And he took a position of a professor of human genetics at the Collège de France. Currently, he's a professor of genetic at the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Strasbourg and president of the French Foundation for Rare Disease. Jean-Louis, please. Please welcome uh, Professor Jean-Louis Mandel. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation and this uh, prestigious institute. Uh, we were very impressed by what we saw in uh, the Moses uh, uh, laboratory and uh, also, of course, for the Cavley Prize. And uh, just a small correction, I am now for the past uh, six years, a retired professor <laughs> at uh, the uh, University of Strasbourg, Emeritus, as they say. So, um, I'll uh, have a, a mixed uh, lecture with uh, a little bit of history, uh, actually starting 80 years ago uh, with the Fragile X and a uh, 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 current project. I hope I can go up to the end. Uh, and so this is our, do you see? Yes, it's okay. Uh, our beautiful institute in the outskirts of uh, Strasbourg. Uh, this was uh, uh, initiated by Pierre Chambon, a famous molecular biologist. And so uh, uh, I have been interested uh, for the past now uh, 40 years uh, by uh, uh, genetic forms of uh, intellectual disability. It started with the fragile X, but then went on to, to, to some other uh, genes. Uh, and uh, uh, this is part of uh, neurodevelopmental disorders that start early in life. And, you know, there were different clinical entities uh, and they were considered as rather separate. And when you look at the genomic studies, the big sequencing studies, for instance, you had separate cohorts, you know, intellectual disability cohorts. Generally, these were doctors who were looking at these cohorts. Uh, um, autism cohorts were more scientists, neuroscientists, I would say. Uh, and uh, childhood epilepsy, you had neurologists, specialists of epilepsy. And uh, we'll see that uh, nowadays uh, one tend to uh, reunite this in a continuum with, of course, various uh, um, clinical manifestations that, that very often overlap and the genes are often the same. Uh, so intellectual disability, which was my, my focus, affects about 1 to 2 percent of children or young adults uh, and has become in the last uh, 20 years, I think, the most common indication for medical genetic consultation. And among them, the fragile X is the most frequent familial form of intellectual uh, disability and with also uh, autism manifestation. It affects more severely males and females because it's X-linked. And, uh, uh, of course, trisomy 21 is more frequent, but it is uh, sporadic. Now, a little bit of history of uh, 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 the Fragile X, or even prehistory, because uh, for me the Anno 1 is... Uh, the, the, the one in 1976 where Grant Sutherland in Australia uh, showed what are the conditions to see by cytogenetic, the culture condition, to see by cytogenetic this fragile site. 
But so the first description, retrospectively, because of course they didn't have cytogenic at the time, was in 1943, where two uh, UK uh, British people uh, describe a very large uh, uh, pedigree with uh, uh, X-linked intellectual disability. They said in the paper, idiocy. That was show how the vocabulary has, has changed. And then, uh, uh, when cytogenic was started, uh, the, an American cytogeneticist described in 1969 a family, three-generation family, with, uh, I think, three or four affected males uh, with intellectual disability and an X chromosome that looked funny because it seemed that you, you see it uh, in the... Uh, uh, I do. Yeah, here. Uh, oh. Sorry. Uh, it seemed to break. Uh, and so he called it a marker X chromosome. He published this one family in 1969. And for six years, there were no other paper on such type of families. So you could think this must be very rare. And then a team of medical and cytogenetics in France, Jean-François and Marie-Geneviève Mattei, described six other cases, and noting this all six cases from six different families at all big ears. So some kind of... And this fragile uh, uh, site, so the X uh, chromosome that seems to break. Now... Uh, then enters another cytogenetic, Grant Sutherland, coming back from Australia and wanted to study families he had seen which such fragile site before going in postdoc. He goes back and he went to study and he doesn't find the fragile site anymore. And then he wonders what has changed and what has changed is the culture medium for the lymphocytes. And then he tested systematically all the goodies that had that were different, and actually the difference was the amount of folate. And so he described these as folate-sensitive fragile site. And then everybody could start seeing this and seeing that it was actually rather frequent. Uh, so uh, this started the first epidemiological studies, the clinical studies, showing that there were some morphological features on the face, on the macroorchidism uh, in males, etc. And in Hawaii, uh, there was uh, uh, two famous uh, uh, geneticists, uh, Pat Jacobs, a cytogeneticist, a Newton Morton, an epidemiologist, husband and wife. And... Uh, uh, I think it was a postdoc, Stephanie Sherman, who started to look at the genetic epidemiology of Fragile X and really remarked that there was a very abnormal inheritance pattern with the penetrance uh, that seemed to increase in succeeding generations. So in the older generation, there had very few, if any, affected uh, people. And then suddenly, you had a lot of affected and that it depended on uh, the place so, uh, in the pedigrees, and you had these non-affected trans obligatory transmitting males, and all this was called the, the Sherman paradox, and people started to imagine that there must be some curious uh, mutation there, but nobody really could uh, understand what. And we had started by serendipity, a word that has been uh, told, uh, um, on Fragile X. Actually, I had decided in 1982 to start working on uh, X chromosome uh, uh, disease for which the gene had not been identified, and my targets were rather Duchenne muscular dystrophy and hemophilia. But uh, by chance... Um, somebody in Strasbourg at the company actually had cloned the factor IX gene. I knew it was on the X. We mapped it, and it looked like in the same region, maybe that the this fragile X where I had read one paper. And so we started with fragile X, uh, 
thanks actually to uh, uh, the, the Matei, who had several large families, because when you were doing linkage, you needed families, the largest possible, uh, the most numerous as possible. So we started uh, on Fragile X in 83. At that time, it was still very poorly known. And here in the pictures, you have, uh, uh, we were joined by uh, many different groups, and in particular, uh, there were three groups that actually found uh, either the gene or the expansion, and we found the expansion and the CPG methylation in Strasbourg, in Adelaide, Australia. This was Grant Sutherland Group. And the Atlanta-Houston-Rotterdam collaboration with uh, uh, Ben Ustra and um, uh, uh, David Nelson and uh, Steve Warren, the late Steve Warren. So uh, when we started to be very near uh, this uh, uh, the site, you know, we, we have been working for eight years to uh, go from this initial marker to finally find uh, 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 the location of, of the mutation. And it looks uh, very long because uh, technology at the time <laughs> is not what uh, happened. So, uh, genome had not been sequenced, of course. And uh, compared to uh, uh, Huntington uh, disease, uh, where they uh, uh, actually identified the location uh, uh, just a few months before us in 1983, they took 10 years. So eight years was uh, a decent time. And when we started to see, uh, to, to be really close, we started to see very bizarre things where um, children had inherited uh, fragments that you could see by the southern blood technique that were not uh, uh, found in the parents and uh, some of the parents had abnormal fragments uh, but uh, smaller ones and uh, we figured out and also you had sometimes smears indicating heterogeneity in size and we figured out uh, quite rapidly that there was two different uh, 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 modification. One was indeed an expansion of uh, uh, a region in the five prime untranslated uh, region uh, and where we found uh, uh, CGG repeats. And it was shown that it was indeed an expansion of CGG repeats that were uh, located in the five prime uh, UTR. And uh, uh, in the uh, normal population, this is polymorphic. And people like you and me uh, have uh, between, I would say, 6 and 40, 45, uh, and are uh, perfectly uh, normal. And then uh, uh, it can go, and you see it in the of uh, the older generation, uh, to uh, a length between 60 and about 200. And these expanded fragments are, have no abnormal uh, DNA methylation. And we call this a premutation, because at the time we concluded that it was uh, not associated at least with a mentorization or with any phenotype. Uh, but when a woman was carrier of this premutation, only when it was through a woman, uh, it uh, could expand uh, much larger than 250 to 1,000 repeats and started the abnormal methylation, not only of the CGG repeat, but of uh, um, uh, a CPG island uh, that was in the uh, regulatory region for expression. And the result of this was that the gene, actually the gene that had been identified by the uh, um, uh, Holland and uh, US collaboration, uh, and it was a gene of unknown function, so they call him uh, FMR1, Fragile X Mental Redation 1, uh, uh, the methylation actually repressed the expression of the gene. So a very complex mechanism, but uh, at the end, it's a loss of function of the FMO1 gene. 
And all this we showed could be seen uh, uh, on a southern blot, a technique that now the young people don't even know what it is, I guess. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and who was at southern? Uh, and uh, uh, combining uh, restriction enzymes uh, that are sensitive to uh, DNA methylation, you could observe both the expansion and the methylation. And so on this uh, uh, southern blood here, you actually, for each family, can understand who is at risk of transmitting, who uh, is at risk of being affected himself, being uh, male, female, uh, showing a case with mosaicism uh, between uh, premutation and mutation, etc. Uh, all uh, things that are actually very important for telling to a family whether a given person in the family is at risk of transmitting Fragile X, of having directly uh, kids affected by Fragile X. And so this actually technique was used for 20 years for, uh, well, uh, uh, for diagnosis. Now, when we published it, the premutation was a risk to have, if you are a female, kids affected with a fragile X, but uh, we thought it has no uh, pathological meaning. And in fact, it took about three, four years to find out that uh, women with a premutation, but not those with a full mutation, uh, have a much higher chance of having premature ovarian failure or primary ovarian insufficiency. And this affects, of course, their uh, reproduction possibilities. Um, but the most astonishing, and uh, I'll go back if I can, uh, uh, is uh, it's, uh, it took 10 years to start recognizing a severe clinical phenotype that was linked to the um, uh, premutation, and which is the uh, fragile X tremor ataxia syndrome. Um, and this was Randy and Paul Hagerman in California. And they started in 2001 by de describing five elderly men with this phenotype in fragile X families. And I remember some very famous and very good uh, uh, clinical geneticists in, uh, in Europe who didn't believe it. It was only five patients. And you look, you know, neurodegenerative, so you know, older people have tremors, so what? But mostly they said, if it was true, I would have seen it. But actually, you see it only if you ask for it. And you don't ask when you uh, have a, a, a kid uh, with uh, intellectual disability, whether the grandfather has some kind of uh, neurogenerative disease. And so quickly, there were 26 patients in, uh, described, and then an epidemiology study and penetron study in 2004 by Sébastien Jacquemont in the Hagerman uh, uh, laboratory. So, uh, and this meant that different states of the same mutation were causing two very different phenotypes. And now, uh, this has been uh, uh, explained uh, by work from many people, including in our institute by Nicolas Charlet, who is not part of my team, but uh, who I'm quite close, and uh, who showed that actually uh, from this expanded uh, uh, repeat in the premutation, where you have still transcription, you, uh, you, the, the translation system the ribosome use uh, a, a near co uh, co cognate uh, initiation uh, codon, uh, an ACG, uh, and uh, produce a small polyglycine uh, containing protein. Now, when the expansion is normal, it's the, the, the protein is too small and is unstable. So you don't see it. But when you have the premutation, you have still 
transcription, so you have still a messenger, but the polyglycine is longer, more toxic, and more stable. And so this is uh, a, a new form of uh, expansion disorder due to uh, polyglycine expansion, and he showed that another uh, uh, neurodegenerative disease has a similar mechanism, uh, the uh, um, nuclear inclusion uh, disease. And actually, uh, and we'll hear this from Mary Orr, I think, and, and, and Huda, uh, that uh, very soon after the myotonic dystrophy was identified, and then uh, uh, in uh, 1993, Huntington and Skawan uh, uh, was identified as a uh, repetition, uh, expansion repetition disorder. Uh, we found in 96, uh, with also Massimo Pandolfo uh, and Michel Koenig, that uh, Friedrich ataxia was a recessive form of expansion uh, uh, disease with a repeat uh, within an intron, and it was a recessive form. And so it increased rapidly the number and then stopped around uh, 2000, 2005, and I thought, okay, it's finished. And suddenly, uh, 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 when um, sequencing improved and started to be able to sequence these unsequenceable uh, regions before, uh, there started to be a flurry of new uh, uh, expansion disorder. We are now at about 60, uh, and uh, I would just point out the, the, the expansion may be in the coding region, being uh, polyglutamine, polyalanine, or now we know uh, actually uh, polyglycine, uh, but it's both non-coding and finally coding for a uh, reason I, I showed you. Uh, but for instance, a very curious uh, uh, disease, which is the familial adult myoclonic epilepsy, you have now six different genes that have nothing to do uh, uh, functionally or structurally, uh, uh, but uh, they are associated to this familial disease because the intronic expansion, the motif of the intronic expansion is the same. So it seems that what is really toxic is this specific uh, uh, expansion uh, and uh, not, uh, it's a pentanucleotide expansion, and not uh, the gene uh, in which it is. So it's uh, very curious. So uh, as the, the disease was, uh, the fragile, going back to fragile X, was caused by uh, finally a deficiency in expression of uh, the, the, the protein FMRP. And um, as uh, um, uh, actually there are a few patients, a very minor proportion of the patients to have conventional loss of function mutation, so you're sure that uh, really it's the deficiency of the protein the responsible for the syndrome. We started to look at protein interactors and notably we identified a highly conserved uh, 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 family of two, two very close protein uh, as interactors and linking fMRP to the RAC1 pathway and this pathway is implicated in uh, uh, actin remodeling in, in synaptic plasticity. So uh, uh, this was uh, uh, two, two papers that were then followed by uh, other people who uh, can use you to uh, uh, look at the function of this CIFIP family in the context of indeed uh, synaptic plasticity. And uh, also it was found uh, uh, originally by Steve Warren that fMRP is an mRNA binding protein uh, that may play a role in mRNA transport and translation, regulation at synapse. And so the question is a specificity for certain targets. And so what are the mRNA targets? So uh, with uh, uh, Hervé Moine, who is a specialist of uh, uh, protein RNA interaction and who came uh, in the lab, uh, he showed that actually fMRP uh, uh, was binding specifically to specific structure called G quartets uh, 
in the Marinais, and a few months later, Jennifer and Bob Darnell at Rockefeller uh, uh, had uh, similar observations, so it looked good. But then uh, uh, there were people continued and uh, uh, started to increase the number of interactors and target transcripts. Uh, so Darnell published in Cell a set of uh, 840 uh, fMRP target, and Tom Tushel, also in Rockefeller, actually, published in Nature, he found uh, uh, at least uh, 940 genes that showed uh, high enrichment. There was not too much overlap, so it was a bit complicated. The cell was were different. The technique was not exactly the same. And uh, Hervé um, continued, and starting from hypocampal mouse cells and comparing wild-type and knockout mouse, uh, publishing in 2016 that he had found an amaray target that was really uh, uh, much more, uh, had a much bigger affinity and was clearly distinguished from all the other uh, uh, more uh, other interactors. And this controls, this is a, a messenger uh, for a very interesting uh, member of the diacetyl glycerol kinase activity, uh, and which is uh, uh, an enzyme involved in, in signaling, and notably in signaling will, uh, of uh, metabotropic uh, glutamate receptor, notably. So uh, I, I will come back if I can because this is a very interesting uh, potential uh, therapeutic target. Now, I, I'll show things that are not... Well, I am... Uh, how, how much do I have? Still four minutes on it? Wow. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I thought I... Okay. Uh, so, uh, th this is work that was not done by, by our group but showing how you go from the gene to potential uh, uh, therapy. And this is when the uh, uh, electrophysiologist, Mark Baer, started to study the Fragile X mouse, uh, which actually is a knockout mouse. It's not a model of the mutation. It's a knockout because the mutation cannot be really modeled in, uh, uh, in mouse, at least not the full mutation. And he found out that there were increased uh, long-term uh, depression, which is a uh, metabotropic uh, uh, um, uh, glutamate receptor linked uh, uh, um, feature of uh, synaptic plasticity. There was less LTP. There were decreased ampere receptors. And uh, this led to the idea that uh, there was overactivation of this uh, metabotropic glutamate uh, signaling, and this was due, or hypothesized to be due, uh, uh, by fMRP being an inhibitor of translation that was necessary for the signaling of uh, mGluR. So if you remove fMRP, you then have over-signaling by mGluR. And what was interesting is that glutamate receptor could be potential therapeutic targets, and actually the pharmas had already uh, uh, agonists or antagonists for these. Uh, a few years later, uh, they were uh, added as potential therapeutic carb, uh, targets, the GABA receptor, GABA-B receptor, uh, uh, and uh, other uh, uh, proteins, and a lot of potential uh, candidate drugs. And indeed, the uh, big pharma, Novartis and Roche, started to be interested uh, because they had antagonist mGluR5 uh, uh, receptor molecules. And a company funded by Mark Baer, Mark Baer uh, and backed by Roche had an agonist GABA B receptor because the GABA B signaling was. Uh, uh, diminished, so you wanted to stimulate it. And actually, this corresponded to a period where Fragile X became an exemplary autism condition. It's very interesting uh, 
up to uh, 2006, autism was not really a major problem in fragile X. It was known that 10 to 20% maybe uh, of uh, patients had some autistic features, but it was not. And that suddenly, uh, fragile X becomes the exemplary autism condition. And so there start to be three different uh, clinical trials. And you know about their positive results in the New York Times or in uh, uh, Time magazine, as you can see here. Then, when there start to be publication, it's a little bit different because uh, they say no significant effect on primary outcome measure, but in an exploratory postdoc, you find some patient responding. Here, seven out of 30. The second for the GABA B uh, agonist, no difference with placebo, but post-op subgroup of 37 respond. So there was still hope. They started bigger clinical trials. The families thought, you know, if the big pharma are there, it's, it's close. And then in 2013, uh, uh, CSI Therapeutics stops the uh, GABA B agonist uh, trial. Novadis then stop uh, uh, when their MGLUR antagonist and Roche in September of the same year stops also everything for their uh, 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 for their uh, also antagonist MGLUR antagonist. And there is an interesting paper uh, that is actually written by academic clinicians and people from these uh, same uh, companies that uh, think about what happened, why, although the preclinical things in mouse seemed that it could work, it should work, it didn't work. And one of the things was that the outcome measure uh, were not proper and was, you know, behavior checklists that were uh, scored by the parents, and they were very sensitive to placebo effects, etc. And so they said that objective measures of core phenotype, such as direct assessment of cognition and language, rather than just behavior, uh, uh, should be implemented in the future. And also the more sensitive problem of starting earlier, because these were at most adolescent or adult, and maybe... Uh, because of the plasticity of brain, maybe you have to start early. So uh, there's still a big list of potential candidates, and uh, we have added one uh, with this uh, dacylglycerol kinase activity. It's the, uh, a family of nine uh, uh, proteins, and uh, the one uh, that seems to be, uh, or that uh, is the target of uh, uh, FMRP uh, in, uh, is actually the least known. It's called DGKK, and it controls in the, in the brain the switch between uh, diacylglycerol and phosphatidic acid, so two very important signaling. And the fact is that uh, um, when FMRP is absent, the MGLUR uh, stimulated uh, 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 action of uh, uh, DGKK is actually suppressed, and this actually results in uh, uh, increased DAG versus phosphatidic acid, and this could explain both the protein, uh, protein translation effect uh, on uh, um, uh, stimulation in, uh, that is seen in the mouse model or in cells from uh, uh, patients, and uh, um, FM1 showed that uh, by um, actually expressing through a, a, an AV vector uh, a form of uh, DGKK that is insensitive, that does not need FMRP to be translated, uh, you achieve long-term rescue of uh, uh, several of the uh, phenotypes in the Fragile X syndrome mass model. So another uh, interesting uh, um, 
potential uh, uh, therapeutic uh, uh, target. Okay, so I have finished. Uh, no, can I have uh, five minutes more or no? <laughs> Two minutes. So, then I will, uh, you know, this is my uh, problem in general. I will shift on these thousand plus genes, but we'll hear probably uh, from Christopher about these many genes that underline now uh, genetic forms of, uh, um, uh, uh, of intellectual disability, autism, epilepsy, etc. Uh, so I shift. Just, you see, just showing because this is actually an Oslo Trondheim Strasbourg collaboration. Because I have been directing uh, uh, um, for many years uh, genetic diagnosis lab. And of course, genetic diagnosis is important for the family to give an explanation why their kid has some severe cognitive behavioral manifestation. Uh, but of course, uh, and also uh, allows genetic counseling, maybe uh, uh, in some case uh, whether you uh, could benefit from uh, uh, prenatal diagnosis or not. But the question then is, what does it change for the patient? Is there a treatment that can be linked to the actual mutation? And I want just to show this one child that uh, we diagnosed in, in, in Strasbourg, and there were two other cases. I don't know whether it was in Oslo and Trondheim, because there were authors from both, that uh, suffered from uh, autosomal dominant sleep-related hypermotor epilepsy. The guy in Strasbourg, a 10-year-old, had 50 seizures per night. It was untreatable. They tried all the possible uh, anti-epileptic drug, it failed. He could not go uh, to school anymore. He had behavioral problems linked to the fact that he could not sleep. It was really terrible. We sequenced it and found a mutation in uh, a subunit of the nicotinic cholinergic receptor. There were a few publications on adults saying that this might be nicotine sensitive. And for these three patients, the two in Norway, and the one in Strasbourg. Uh, they got nicotine patch, and the seizures about disappeared. The, the Strasbourg guy could go back to school. Of course, his brain has been affected by all these years of having seizures, but still he can go now back to school, learn uh, with some educational support, improvement in control and that attention, reduction of impulsiveness, etc. So it shows that sometimes, too rarely, by finding the cause, you may find a uh, surgery. And this leads me just to, uh, if I have three minutes, <laughs> I try to negotiate. My current project, you know, I'm retired, but I have a project on um, uh, uh, this problem of, we have now more than 1,000 rare disease that cause intellectual disability or autism or epilepsy. And how can you efficiently build cohorts of patients and get information of medical interest on the severity, the natural histories, the comorbidities, the aspects that affect most quality of life that could be useful for both the families and the professionals? And uh, how can you recruit also uh, uh, courts for uh, uh, clinical trials, and uh, uh, I, I decided that the ones that are the most likely to be motivated to have the time and be willing are the parents. And so this is a form of participatory research and database for all genetic forms of intellectual uh, disability and autism that we have set starting in 2016, uh, where we have online a structured questionnaire, mostly multiple choice questions, exploring all the physiological pathway that could lead to comorbidities, you know, whether 
its heart or muscle or skin, and, um, uh, and where parents can also tell what affects most the quality of life, what has affected most uh, um, the health of the patient. And we, currently we have six, uh, 1,600 uh, active participating parents who filled this uh, thing, and we can then generate this type of graph what for a given uh, uh, form, here for instance, uh, Coulin de Vries uh, uh, disorder, uh, we have uh, more than now 230 parents participating. Uh, what are the main problems? And then when you see that there is quite a number of parents reporting behavior problems, we can look at what type of uh, behavior problems and what is the intensity of the problem? Is it a major problem, a moderate problem, or a minor problem, or is, is it absent? And we can now, uh, we, we know that it's, a, we find the same data when it was already known uh, and published, uh, but uh, we have more data on which type of epilepsy, for instance, uh, what are the drugs that have been used and uh, what is the perception by the parents? What are the adverse effects? And we discovered novel things. For instance, that asthma is frequent, but also uh, uh, respiratory infections. And this is written by the parents. Severe pneumonia and bronchial problem, repetitive pneumonia, reoccurring pneumonia, inflammation des bronches, bronchopneumonia chronica, etc. Uh, bronchitis recurrente. Obviously, this is a concern for 20% of the parents and was not known. So it was just to show that this is a way maybe to learn about the medical features uh, and the behavioral features. And uh, this, uh, I think, is uh, very useful. And uh, if anybody is interested, I can talk after. Thank you, and sorry for...